Okay, we are live. Um, as always, we're just going to wait a few minutes, let everyone join, uh, let everyone find the link on YouTube, on the website. I can see seven people are already watching. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, in case you missed it just now, all I have said is that we're going to wait a minute or two just to let some more people join. Um, but I hope you're all having a nice morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you're joining from. It's morning. Saiv and I are both based in Berlin. So it's actually a bit of a gloomy, I won't say gloomy, but it's cooled down a bit. It's been really warm here for the last while. So I'm actually grateful <coughs> of the, the chilly. With some respite. Yeah, a little bit of respite from, from the heat. But um, yeah, we're just going to give it a minute or two. No worries. And where are we streaming from again? from LinkedIn from YouTube from, yeah from YouTube we're live on YouTube and also via the the total data website itself so it's live on, on both those platforms excellent and um, please get in touch with us via the comment section we'd love to hear from you and if you have any questions that pop up in your mind throughout the the demo and throughout this presentation we'd love to hear from you definitely okay I'm gonna I'm gonna give it one more minute because I'm aware that uh I think from our side, it's hard to tell how many people are watching from YouTube, but I can see from here. Um, and as always, if anyone misses anything or if you missed the beginning or if you want to share with colleagues or, or um, someone you think might be interested, because it's streamed live to YouTube, you'll be able to access it on YouTube afterwards as well. So if for whatever reason, you miss some, hopefully you don't, but if that should happen or if you know someone who might be interested, you can you can share the recording with them afterwards. Um, I think we should just get started on, on that basis. It's been it's been two minutes. We've, we've let people have two minutes to join us. Um, so I guess before we begin, we have the, the title screen up here, which hopefully you can all see. So you're very, very welcome to our Education with Innovation webinar, where we'll be discussing digital m and &E in the education sector. Um, I'm aware that quite a few people could be joining from Erasmus Plus projects and programs. So we'll be talking not only about education sector specifically, but education training and other things which are adjacent to those and how you can apply digital m and &E to to projects um, in that kind of sphere. Um, before we go any further, we've already chatted a little bit, but to introduce myself, my name is Hannah Maroney. I'm a digital solutions consultant at Tola Data, and I have been so for the last two years or so, um, with a background in, in NGOs as well. And uh, Saiv, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Hannah. So my name is Saif. I am the customer success executive here at Tola Data based in Berlin. Um, myself and Hannah are actually both from Ireland, but we currently uh, reside here in the headquarters in Germany. Um, and yeah, I've been here for almost around a year. I've worked with many different fantastic partners that we have, uh, one of which I think the first one I had was an educational uh, charity. And seeing the work and the pivotal role that education has had on people both young and old um, really excited me. So that's why I'm delighted to be presenting Tola Data for you today here and to show you how you can make more informed data driven decisions, harmonize your workflow and really further your impact. So I'll pass it back to Hannah. Thanks. I, I couldn't agree more. It's the kind of it's the awesome thing of Tola Data is you get to meet so many people working in so many different types of projects and organizations and you get experience in the way that these programs work for recently we were discussing agriculture today we we're discussing education and it's so wonderful to be able to get a kind of deep dive into how that works in in, in different ways for different people as well um so yeah i'm also very excited to, to be discussing specifically education training erasmus plus that kind of side of things today um, so if we quickly take a look at what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to start with a kind of general discussion on why m and &E is important for the sector. Um, like I said, I know from um, 
uh, our, our marketing team reached out to a lot of you in Erasmus Plus partner programs. Um, so <clears throat> M&E in this field is so important because it can truly have such an impact on your results and therefore on the impact that you also uh, create in your programs. Um, so of course, we're gonna then go into how digital tools can help. Um, monitoring and evaluation, I think, the majority of people who join an, an M&E webinar are going to agree that M&E is important, but digital M&E, how different tools can come into that. We want to discuss how that can 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 help you. And then, of course, how to choose them. Um, there are a lot of digital tools out there. Digital tools, this word encompasses all things digital, anything you might use somewhere along the, the journey of your your M&E practice so uh, we'll, we'll have a quick overview I think um, because it's impossible to cover everything but uh, we also welcome I should say as as Saev mentioned the comments you can comment um, if you're joining us from YouTube and they can pop up here for us on, on our side and I can even share some on the screen um, and we'll be able to, to discuss that way. And then we're going to move into the demo portion um, and Saev's actually going to take that she has created loads of sample data within Tola data to show you how you can bring it together how you can make the most of it how you can generate reports and dashboards to tell the world what you've achieved with your with your uh, digital lemony for your program and then in the end hopefully we'll have a few minutes for some questions and uh, a bit of a, a bit of a discussion towards the end and hopefully we'll run that via via Mentimeter so it'll be a bit of a interactive session. But let's get started straight away. We want to talk about why do we want to use digital tools for M&E? Like I said, I would hope that most people who are joining or watching this back on YouTube will agree that M&E itself is important. We're, we're, we're doing it. But why do we want to digitize it? And I think M&E was traditionally quite a paper-based practice, which meant a lot of administration. You might even end up like this poor guy in the cartoon who wants a, a search and rescue mission if he doesn't come back from his flurry of paper in a few days. Um, and this is because, like um, these, these people in, in the image, um, you had to physically store the data. You know, you, you didn't have these, these digital capacities to store that data, keep track of it, Maybe you're using like Excel at a push, but you're not, you know, encompassing the, the possibilities that digital tools have to offer you. So basically, there was a lot of uh, administration and this can very quickly become really time consuming, really resource intensive. Um, and there are therefore, of course, many, many advantages to using digital tools for your m and &E. And we've listed some of them here. If you can think of any more, please add them, um, add them in the YouTube comments. I'd be more than happy to, to share them on screen or, or to discuss them afterwards. Maybe someone who watches back wants to, wants to check out what, what other people have to say. But some of the examples we've listed here, you can use digital tools to improve your data quality. Whenever data has to be entered manually, the risk of error increases. It's 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 quite simple. So digital tools reduce this risk because you're having a machine do it for you. The, the risk of human error therefore goes, goes down quite dramatically. You can also use digital tools to automate the processing of your data. So for example, the calculation of results, uh, aggregation analysis, visualization, even reporting, all of that can be completely digitized and it makes it very very quick and, and helps with your with your resource allocation as well um, for immediate access to real-time insights and I think this is a really important factor because it means that information is always not only immediately available but it's the most accurate information possible I think so I might touch on this a little bit more when we when we look at the demo but for example, when you're using a, a paper-based practice, you don't know if this paper that you're reading is from a week ago and you've conducted a survey since then and it's no longer, it's no longer accurate. Or maybe, for example, something with um, in the education and training sector, if you're looking at something like a literacy rate, that needs to be the most up-to-date information possible when you're sharing that with, with donors, stakeholders, teammates. Um, so with digital tools, it's very easy to automate those processes so that you're always seeing absolute accurate information. Um, 
You can also use them to connect easily to remote or, or inaccessible sites that may be more difficult to monitor. Um, to implement best practices because uh, essentially digital tools can, can guide your teams in the way data is collected, managed, analyzed, and this ensures that you, your best practices are enforced throughout the life cycle of your project. And then the final uh, example that we have here is uh, that digital tools can be used for non knowledge management and data retention. So with digital tools, you can ensure that your data is stored in one place easily accessible to all staff, both during and after the project, because as much as I personally believe, and I know a lot of my connections and people who might be joining today also believe that evaluation is very important during the life cycle of your project and no longer a practice you will do after the project has ended. But it's also important to be able to, to look back and see what went well before so you can implement it again, what didn't go so well in the last project and, and digital tools ensures that you're able to do that, you're able to look back in that way. So if we agree that they're important, we want to think about what tools are out there and available to us. Um, and as I mentioned very briefly at the beginning, there are a lot of tools out there. Um, but here I've broken them down into kind of three main categories. So firstly, you have your data collection, so many options. Microsoft Excel, Kobo Toolbox, a personal favorite, uh, Survey CTO, Tola Data also has its own uh, inbuilt form builder. There are so many options for your data collection. Then secondly, once the data is collected, we move into the second column and it's time to it's time to use it. Essentially, it has to be managed, reports have to be generated. Um, depending on your needs, there are different options. And this is where Tola Data comes in for your, for your m and &E, for your management and reporting. And then finally, if you want a, a far more in-depth analysis, you can export the data entered in the second step to another tool like, uh, like Tableau or Power BI um, into, into the third step. But how do you choose these digital tools? If we're talking about there's so many options and it's so important, you want to be able to then decide what's right for me, what's right for my team, my organization. Um, I guess there are a number of factors to consider and some slightly more important than others. And maybe you'll have even, even more examples. And again, you're more than welcome to add them in the comments if you'd like to. But again, we've listed some examples here of uh, how you can choose the best digital tools for you. And the first one, perhaps the most obvious, is that it's appropriate to your context and your, your requirements or your needs. So there are many questions to think about, like what type of project it is that you're running. Um, how many organizations are involved, how complex the project is. Is it like a multi-layered project with lots of different uh, sub-projects or maybe there's kind of a hierarchy where you have your, your program, your theme, your, your more minor projects going, or is it just one project encompassing, encompassing one uh, element? You might have different needs depending um, on those things. You might also want to think about the possibility of integration with other tools. Um, this is, it's an interesting one because as it says here on the screen, there are no tools that do everything. And that's simply because I think every tool wants to be the master of the specific thing that they do. And if you found a tool that had everything, then it's not gonna do, it's not gonna do the niche things absolutely perfectly, is it? Um, so you want to find tools that have the flexibility to integrate with one another. Um, and also to incorporate new tools in the future. And uh, as I've added at the end there, most importantly, you want to avoid data silos. We also have the online versus offline. Uh, we're talking about digital tools. I think our minds immediately go to online. And I think it's, it's pretty reasonable because most of the time you are going to be using these in an online capacity. But for example, um, if you are out at a training center that has no access to Wi-Fi, or if you're in a, a school in a remote location, you want to be able to collect data there. So you want to make sure that the data collection tool you've chosen has a, an offline capability. And then for example, when you come to that second step, you wanna manage and report, that's when you can come to an online tool and input that offline collected data. Um, data protection more important than ever. I feel like it's such a buzzword. It's, it's always been important, but it's, it's everywhere at the moment, I think. So it's important to, to check where your data is stored. 
Compliance with local regulations, for example, uh, as we mentioned, Tola data we're based in Germany, so we must comply with the GDPR. Um, so you can just check for your for your your region and, and where your programs are, are taking place. One of the most important points, in my opinion, is this uh, penultimate one here to make sure it's user friendly. Um, the people using the software need to be happy to do so. It needs to make their life easier. It needs to be something valuable that makes it easier for them to do their job and, and doesn't just add more tasks to the list. And it also helps if you, for example, if you're a project manager trying to implement a new tool to a team, I feel like this is, is something that is discussed quite frequently. Like we want to minimize adding new tools, adding new tools. It just overwhelms people. And if you want to ensure that your team really picks up the new tool and it's it's taken off and, and used to its fullest potential, it needs to be user friendly and they need to want to, to use it. And then finally, um, the last point is the cost to set up. Um, Today, there's no need to build custom tools. I feel like this is becoming more and more so a thing of the past. There are a lot of off the shelf tools available that require little to no customization to implement in your teams. So I want to show you what an integrated kind of full data cycle might look like um, using digital tools for your data collection with total data then at the heart of your cycle for your monitoring and evaluation needs. Um, so this example shows you a number of options for your data collection down here on the left. You might do your data collection offline in Kobo Toolbox or online using a Tola data form or in Survey CTO or any other, any other digital collection tool. And then you have direct real-time import um, into, into Tola data with the Tola data forms or maybe a direct uh, API integration into Tola data from Kobo or from ONA. Um, you do your m &E, your management, your tracking, reporting in Tola data. Um, you can visualize and report on your data within Tola data or for an optional kind of more advanced BI analysis, you can export that from Tola data into another tool like uh, Power BI or, or Tableau. Um, so if I've shown you what that looks like, Maybe there's there's people joining who have never even seen inside Total Data, so I'm very excited to hand over to Saiv and she's going to show you what it looks like in there. Perfect. Thanks, Hannah. That's great. So now for this next step, I'm going to have to share my screen. So I'll ask you, Hannah, if you wouldn't mind letting me share and also letting me know if this appears up. I can see it, yeah. Perfect. Is the font size big enough or will I go a bit... Maximize um, a little bit more. Looks good to me, but perhaps if, if there's an issue for anyone, add it in the comment on, on YouTube and 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 we can adjust. That no does worries. look right to me. To be safe, I've gone in just a little bit more just in case. I know sometimes people might have the best connection. But in any case, thanks again, Hannah. So hi, everybody. Um, now I'm bringing you on to the Tola Data website. So here is our m &E tool, which I'll be showing you today. And I'm really looking forward to showing you a, an educational project that we've set up. This educational project will, will not only show you, you know, how to um, put in a lot of interesting and useful m &E tools, but I'll also be showing you how to integrate uh, one of the SDG goals that you might be trying to now include into your projects as it's now and more in demand by donors and stakeholders. I'll show you how to be integrating that within your project very seamlessly. So before we even begin, I'm going to be showing you um, the navigation of the site and you know the main uh, sections that we'll be covering. So here, as you log in, you're going to be brought to this homepage. And on this homepage, you're going to have an overview of all of your projects here. And on the left-hand side, you're going to have the navigation panel. So today I'm going to be bringing you through this detail section. This is going to be, you know, essentially putting all together the relevant factors of your project. It's going to be establishing uh, essential targets that you'll need to put in place and also cross-cutting tools, such as disaggregations, which will allow you to peel back different layers of data. In this activity section, I'm going to be showing you how you put a step-by-step -step plan together uh, towards your goal. I'll be bringing you through the different tools that we have um, with approvals, with budgets, and also to mark uh, key milestones. 
in this indicator section, I'll be showing you uh, this lovely list. I'll be showing you how to track these different indicators, how to sort of spot trends, how to implement, you know, an anchoring framework and to also include your disaggregations and targets. And the dashboards as well. This is going to be um, where you're going to be essentially creating a window between you and stakeholders so that they can see how well your projects are going. They can have all of the update information. And this is a channel for you to essentially um, be in communication with them with the, the latest data. So now I'm going to head back to this project level. Here, as I mentioned, this is an overview of all of your different projects. However, you can actually group these together in different customizable groups. And this could be thematic, this could be you know, level, or this could be also in portfolios. Um, so today, as I mentioned, I'm gonna be showing this educational project and I can easily hop to it by clicking on it in this drop down menu. And once I've done that, I'm going to head to the details section. So this is essentially you know, the overarching details of the project. And down here, you know, you can modify the name of the project. You can select the status of the project, important start and end dates, its project code, the countries which are associated with this project, who is funded by perhaps in this section. And also, as I mentioned, you can link it to, you know, a portfolio. You can link it to a thematic group or even a level as we do here. And essentially, this project is aiming to contribute towards an SDG goal. Now, the thing about SDG goals is that, you know, there's many different ways of approaching them and often they require different um, methods to be achieved. So that's why we've opted for a multi-pronged approach here. And so this project actually reflects um, one of the ways in which I'm going to address this SDG goal of education. And this one is about improving liter literacy rates of graduating students within two countries of Kenya and South Sudan. So that is what you'll be seeing today. And as we scroll up here, you're going to see the overall budget um, of this project. You're going to see how much has been allocated, how much you have remaining, and how much you have already spent. So under the Sites tab, this is where you can put down the points of engagement for you. So this can be the community that you're engaging with. This could be the, the places in which you're working or collecting data. It's very useful to gather these together to have them in mind. Uh, you can include geographical coordinates and additionally contact numbers um, to you know just ensure that you have all the relevant information here on the software. Under phases here, you can create a nice timeline that outlines you know, the beginning and ends of all of the different phases of your project. This is just useful to have a, you know, a structure in place and to you know, be in the right mindset as you're embarking on your project. This can also be filtered by day, week and month. Under the stakeholders here, this is where you can put together and organize all of the donors, stakeholders and partners that you have. Often in projects, you're gonna have a lot of different stakeholders and partners that are involved in many different projects that you have. It's really good to remind yourself of their different requirements and have them in your mind as you're setting about creating and setting, you know, disaggregations and targets within your project. Under documents here, this really brings about the point of having a place to link all of the data together. It's so important that, you know, you can have one location where you can have all of the data that's relevant for your project because this helps mitigate data silos. So here, this um, tab will allow you to link all the pertinent documents and files that you need um, for your project. And this can be done either via Google Drive and a URL. And if you'd like to include the physical location, you're more than welcome to do so. So say, for example, you have leaflets and you need to let everyone know that it's located in the office in cabinet 100A, feel free to do so here. This just enables everyone to know where all the information is and it avoids it being lost in your computer or in email threads um, or even in a physical location. So targets, so I'm sure everyone knows the targets are really useful to help you prioritize uh, the, the goals of your project and to really figure out what are the most important things to measure. On the system here, we already have targets or you're essentially able to create targets on an annual basis, semi-annual basis or quarterly. 
but we also have enabled you to create your own targets because we're aware that donors or stakeholders may require you to report on a non uh, calendar year uh, period basis and this you know will allow you to create periods that could be two and a half months four and a half months essentially any any time frame that you like we've already created a few here and this just allows you uh, to you know be able to report exactly um, as required by your donor so disaggregation types so as we know, if you enter in raw data and you know you don't qualify it or you don't investigate further into it, you're using a lot of valuable information. Disaggregations really allow you to peel back many different layers of the data. Sometimes the work and the you know the data that you're collecting is not really um, reaching the target you know communities or groups that you're hoping for. And with using disaggregations, you can really find out uh, you know. If it's you know targeting more maybe more a gender maybe more a specific community in the east region of a country so it's i'd say very important to to ensure you have some disaggregations that allow you to um record and see you know precious valuable layers of data within um the data that you input into the system so here we've created a lot of different gender um disaggregations you know ones to do with region etc these can be set on an individual project basis, or this can be set for all of your different projects that you have in the system. And what that essentially enables you to do is if you're aggregating a lot of information and you're aggregating all of the beneficiaries you have in many different projects, you're able to also disaggregate all of these beneficiaries, again, being able to see all the different layers which communities are being best served. Within Tola Data as standard, all of their projects are sort of um, self, they're independent essentially. So this means that, you know, the data is only accessible to those who are linked to the projects. And this is where you can link people to projects. So once they've been added onto your um, account, you can add them here to each project and this will allow them to engage with the data that they see in the project. Over here on the right hand side, we have levels of accessibility. So we have, you know, view only just a project admin and view only is as it says, it's just the ability to be able to see the information, but there's no engagement that the person can really have with it. However, the more you go up this ladder, um, up to project admin, the more engagement that they can have with it, the more ability they can have to add, delete, modify, and do other configuring um, bits around the, the platform. This enables you to have, you know, more of a safeguard over your data to know who can, you know, change it or modify it. And um, just to be, be sure that it's all safe. Under sharing, back again to the fact that every project is sort of self-containing. Um, this sharing function allows you to create channels or bridges between one project to another. So I guess the most um, pertinent example would be if you are doing aggregation and you want to be able to aggregate a lot of information from different projects, you can create channels from these projects to aggregate into an overall program. So that's essentially what this function would be used for here. Now to the activity section. This is the project management section, and this is the section that lends itself to your strategy. And here, what we have set up is activities that have been organized sort of by a hierarchy. So oftentimes I would like to set up an activity, you know, have one as the mainstay. So I'd have it maybe as a phase, and then I'd use, you know, these tasks and subtasks to allow me to break down this activity into very actionable steps. On this list already, there is so much information to be gleaned, you know, about the process, uh, sorry, about the progress of each individual activity, who is responsible for this activity, important dates, uh, and budget information, and also visual information, including these uh, colors that you see here. This is great for project managers if they want to have a quick look over everything and see how pro uh, these activities are going. And <clears throat> within each individual activity, task and subtask, you have um, a range of different tabs that you see up here. So initially on this details level, you can configure everything that you see on the list here. So that includes the name, the person who is responsible, the progress of this activity, uh, the color that you'd like to assign. You can also mark if it's a milestone here. 
You can link this additionally back to the overall timeline that you created on the details level and include important bits of um, information. And bear with me here. I had another one actually I really wanted to show you. It'll give you an idea of what a, a finished project would look like. So in this activity, I set about putting together a stakeholder event. And I use this uh, essentially to plan everything out. So here in the description, I was able to link to a document that helped me see all the relevant events. I gave a brief overview of the main events. I can include pictures here. Under the approvals tab, this is where I can create my approval workflow. And here I was able to um, set uh, my approval you know, for a budget. So I had put together a budget for the stakeholder event and I needed um, a colleague of mine who was responsible for the budget to approve it. So I put this um, document together. I sent this approval to her. She received an email, was redirected back to the site. Um, and I'm still awaiting a decision. So Anya must still um, let me know if I'm authorized or not. But still, everyone who was working on this platform can see when this approval was submitted. And also you can see that um, you know, whoever is in charge of uh, authorization um, has authorized it. So this enables everyone to be on the same page and to get to the next stage of the, the project a lot quicker. Under this uh, budget tab, this is where I was able to write down all the budgetary information of this event. I was able to um, note down <clears throat> all the important bits that I needed to get, how much budget I needed to allocate, how much I've spent and how much I've remaining. The system calculated for me how much I have left and I can create really nice graphs in the dashboard section, either by this activity, you know, just to show the budget I've set for this activity or for my entire project as well. Under documents, again, I could really bring all my information in one place and link important documents to this um, activity. This allowed me to organize it a lot better so that everyone who is working with me on this activity can immediately get access to the important uh, documents that are only relevant to this one. Um, but again, you can uh, link this either via Google Drive or URL, up to you. Um, under these indicators <clears throat> section, this is where I can link indicators that I've already created. What indicators allow me to do here is to measure how successful this activity has been. So here I can see, you know, the status of this indicator, the number of stakeholders who participated, which really um, shows the success of this event is how many people had arrived and were engaging with us. So I can see how, um, how well this uh, indicator went and also some important information on the actuals versus targets here as well. Sites additionally um, are great just to include here uh, to have the most relevant sites um, so that everyone that's working on it knows um, where the event is taking place. That's always good to know. And also the stakeholders um, who are involved additionally. Now, as you're going to be feeding a lot of different new activities into the system, the software will automatically calculate um, the start and end points of all the activities that you've created and we'll create a lovely chart here that you can filter by day week and month and as you can see here these orange um, highlighted words are the milestones that you set so they can pop out at you now to the indicator section so this is really the heart of the software and here we have you know our three main tabs here we often will start with our results framework and um, because this is really the anchoring force the anchoring framework for your project and your indicators and um, this helps break everything down into you know to more achievable goals so here what i've created is a results framework that is going towards improving literacy with uh, graduating students and what i've done is I've created this results framework to have my long-term goals at the top and to break it down to my short-term, more immediate-term goals. So what I've done here is I've included the SDG goal of education up here. Um, so this is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. I have it here. And then I have broken down this project, you know, to improve the literacy rates of students here as my intermediate um, goal. And then here are the ways in which I'm going to go about achieving this goal. So I want to improve uh, you know, teaching. I want to help train teachers. 
Um, I also want to increase school attendance. I need to attract more students there, maybe just to include free school lunches, allow them to have more um, equipment and also to improve access, you know, to libraries perhaps so they can, you know, have access to books. So this results framework also serves in another way because once you've set this up, this will appear in your indicator section. And there, this allows you, as you're creating your indicators, to refer to each um, results framework element you have. This allows you to, you know, maybe if you're creating an indicator and then you feel a bit lost, this helps reorientate you back towards um, the goal at hand. So on this list, again, once more, you can just glean so much information in one quick view. Um, so project managers here can see, you know, the format of all these indicators are, how often are you collecting this information? the status of all these individual indicators and also important actual versus target information, also including KPIs here. Um, I'll briefly show you how easy it is just to set up an indicator. So for example, um, I could be uh, measuring the number of uh, webinars I'm doing. Here, I've got the option of choosing um, from three different options here, formats. So it could be numeric, it could be percentage or qualitative. In this case, I want to be numeric. Um, I have the option here of choosing between an increasing or decreasing direction. In this case, I do want the number of uh, webinars to go up. However, if you're maybe measuring um, number like the rate of waterborne diseases, the rate of illiteracy, you'd want that to be going down, I'm assuming. So that's when you can choose decreasing. Life of program here and the target is um, the target that you have uh, for this individual indicator. So let's just say 20. You can include a baseline if you like, but it's it's not mandatory. And I won't in this case. Uh, underneath here, you can note that you can create this indicator as an aggregated indicator. I'll show you what that looks like soon. But essentially, aggregated indicators do as they say. They help you aggregate information from different indicators. But also on Tolly Data, you can also perform different calculations, such as multiplication, subtraction, division, averages, and even include weights and adjustments to allow you to mitigate against double counting and even do some currency conversion if you, that's what you'd like as well. So once I click save here, my indicator will be saved to this list. It will be under non-classified indicators, but I can easily drag and drop it to appear where I like it. And now I'm going to be showing you one of the indicators to show you what um, they could look like. So once you click into an indicator, you're gonna be brought to the indicator detail section. This is where you're gonna be putting, again, all the surface level bits of information, but also <clears throat> uh, more uh, info maybe on better practices as well and more contextualized data about this indicator. So you can include an indicator number, modify the name, modify its format, where it sits in the results framework element, how often you're collecting it, marking if it's a key performance indicator. In this description, I've added why I'm measuring this indicator, adding some context. In this note section, I'm outlining how I'm collecting this information and also changes that have occurred over, you know, the, the I guess, the time that we've started uh, collecting info on this indicator. And this is useful, you know, if you're working in a team to help everyone be on the same page, but also it helps encourage best practices. So that's why it's very useful to include maybe even the challenges that you have in this note section. Down in the reporting part here, I can include the source that I'm using for this information, um, what information am I taking out, and also how often am I reporting. Under the targets and disaggregations here, you can modify the targets that you've set, include baselines, include the unit of measure that you're going to be using. <clears throat> More excitingly for me, I find <clears throat> this is the place where you're going to be setting your targets and adding your disaggregations. So what's really great is that as soon as you set your periodic targets here, the system will automatically um, compare your actuals against your targets for you. So that's something you don't even need to worry about once you've set these up. Down on the bottom here, you can also link to segregations that you've created on the, the, the disaggregation um, section, and you can link as many as you want. Under the collected data section here, um, you have two options um, on inputting the data into your indicator. So you can either do a manual entry or you can pull it from a data table. So manual entry is very simple. 
this essentially is only two cells that are mandatory. And let's say I have those 15 more students attending lessons. Let's say the date is today. I can include an identifier. This could be the person who collected this information. This could be um, an event from which I'm taking this information. It's up to you and also a site if you'd like. You can include evidence here, either via your Google Drive or URL if this is required. Again, include maybe notes about this information and also you can include disaggregation data. Um, so here I'm gonna disaggregate by gender. Let's say for example, the breakdown was 10, five. Now I haven't put five down here in the male section and I'm gonna show you why. So if you've inputted a value that's say 15 and you're disaggregating and you put down 10 and four, and say you don't notice this, you've been putting in so many different bits of information, disaggregating you know, for hours on end and you've clicked save. And then the system clocks that something is a bit off. Your values are not really corresponding to the ones that you've just put in. This allows mitigate the risk of errors that you're putting in. So the system is kind of nicely reminding you and you can rely a bit on the system to help you mitigate all these errors. So you can go back and correct it if the um, disaggregation is as you'd like it, you can actually still confirm and leave it as is. But this gives you a bit of peace of mind that the system is also looking out for you at times so that it, this will mitigate the errors that you have and that will accumulate over time if not corrected. So here I've added loads of different um, details here. I can uh, put different calculation formulas here to you know have see the average of all the students that have attended the lessons see the median, even see the last collected date. And here I can mark the status of the indicator. So this will be really helpful for my project manager to see. You can additionally in, um, pull um, this from a data table. This is um, ones that you can import uh, you know, via your Kobo Toolbox account, via ONA, which I'll be showing you a bit later, um, or and or you know, uploading by a CSV file. It essentially does the same thing. You can select the data that you want um, through these data tables. So um, you could include, you know, conditions as well, also add disaggregation data. And finally, under this results summary is where you can get um, a nice visualization of the data that you've inputted into your indicators. So here is actually um, an overview of uh, one of our stakeholders of this project. We can see what the results look like on their reported, you know, their um, reporting periods. We can also see a breakdown of how our targets compare against the actuals that we've set. And we can also get some information on the disaggregation results here. Now I'm gonna briefly show you um, our aggregated indicators. So as I mentioned, aggregated indicators allow you to aggregate information. So in this case, um, I was creating a lot of events in which I was teaching um, teachers better educational methods. So I wanted to measure the total number of trainings that we had performed. So to do that, I created an aggregated indicator. And what I did was I was able to add the number of trainings that I had done from each of my programs. And the actuals of the indicators um, is essentially the actuals that I will have, makes the actuals that I will have here on my progress bar. So this um, can be done either within one project or you can do this, you know, beyond this project. So you could aggregate this information into an overarching um, project. And briefly here, I'll just show you that you can perform different calculations if you wish. So now, say, for example, you want to know the average income of teachers in a certain area. You know, you can add loads of indicators with all of the incomes and then perform an average as well. And down here, you have your weights and adjustments. Again, this can be for you know mitigating double counting. This can be for currency conversion. Um, it's really flexible. Um, if you have any other ideas, please let us know in the comments. We'd love to know what you might use these for as well. Now, um, as part of my SDG goal, I actually um, picked an SDG indicator from the UN list of um, SDG indicators from the education section. And this one, um, I found was more, most relevant to my project. <clears throat> and so I actually had an indicator that I had previously that really suited this indicator. So what I did was I created an aggregated indicator of this SDG goal and linked it to um, one of the indicators that I had, which corresponded 
to this SDG goal. So this is how I'm able to measure um, the, the success of my SDG goal and contribute towards it. Now in the form section, this is where you can create online personalized forms that you can send to people online. The beauty about our forms is that as soon as you, well, as soon as you have your respondents uh, entering in information into the forms, that immediately appears on the system. So you have it ready to use. Um, these forms can, you know, have a lot of different uh, text fields, um, sorry, general fields, including dates, including um, numbers, percentages, um, text, of course, as I mentioned, emails, URLs, and also drop down menus. They also can perform skip logic and validation rules. You can uh, create them into templates. So this will allow you to uh, have a standard across not only one project, but you can set them as a template for all of the projects. And again, yeah, this will allow for more consistency in um, the, the information that you're getting. Under data tables here, this is your treasure trove of data. And as I mentioned here, you can actually link your Tola data account with your Kobo Toolbox account, with your ONA account. This allows for seamless importation from them. And additionally, you can do this with Google Sheet and OneDrive. And for any other data collection tool that you're using, you can always download it as a CSV file and upload it here. And just to show you a brief demonstration, for example, with Kobo, I've already linked it with Kobo. And once I click on there, I can select from a table that I already have and import it in two seconds. So it's ready to go. And finally, I think the most exciting part is the dashboards because, you know, you've been feeding your projects very diligently, you know, over maybe several months, several years, and you're ready just to quickly put reports together. And this is how you can do it. You can really put projects and dashboards together so quickly and have it ready to show off the best results to your um, your donors and your partners. So here on our dashboards, we populate them with what we call widgets. And widgets are essentially these boxes that you see here. We have three main types. So that is text and image. So this is what you see here. And um, these can be used for blogs, for articles, for newsletters, and also, you know, for contextualizing data. So that's what I did here. I sort of use these uh, text widgets to help people ease into the information. Um, I also included some nice pictures. Um, I included the status of, of several of our indicators as well. Um, included some line graphs, some actuals versus targets, um, non-cumulative graphs, and even disaggregation graphs. And these are entirely flexible dashboards that can be catered to any of your different donors. You can create as many dashboards as you like. Uh, this can be focused on one indicator, could be focused on one project, it could be focused on all of your projects. So it allows you just to um, prioritize all the requirements that your donors have asked you for. You know, you can filter through all of the information and give them exactly what they need to see. And also very exciting news for us was that we've uh, included a lot new, lot more features on this dashboard section, including styles. So I've had so much fun um, selecting my own colors here. Um, so you can create your own customized colors to align with either your organization or even just personal preference. Um, this was definitely personal preference for me, um, but they're very fun, I assure you. And then also we have, um, you know, our project indicators, which is what I showed you with the line graphs and disaggregations. There is plenty more different graphs that you can also use. So I would recommend you try our free trial and look through them all. And we also have our budget graphs that I had mentioned to you before that you can have graphs for individual activities, or you could even have them for entire projects. And additionally, what's great about these dashboards is as you're feeding the system, if you've set up a dashboard and you're, you maybe have to modify an indicator, you have to add more data, this updates in real time so that all of this is always up to date. You don't need to worry about it once you've set it up. And this allows you, you know, to share this dashboard with others and, you know, for them to be in the know and clued in to all of the, the great results of your project. So you can either share this internally, you know, with one user, with an entire team, with all of the users of Tola data, um, in your organization, not all of them, um, and then or externally. So you can generate an unguessable link here. So if I copy it and paste it here, 
you can see what the you know the viewer of this dashboard will see and essentially it's just going to be a cork board of all that you've put up and they can hover over these graphs and get interesting information and again see all the up-to-date data that you put up because this automatically updates in real time sorry so i need to cut in there for a second i was uh looking at the next section of the webinar for questions and accidentally shared that screen so you were gone for one second but we're back to it. You. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all um and i would say these are the main highlights that I've run through. And of course, as you're going through Twilla data, as I said before, I'd highly recommend um, the free trial where you can look through our guides here and be brought step-by-step step through everything that I've just showed you today. And additionally, you can contact us directly via this live chat. We'd be more than happy to help you if you have a question and or difficulty with something, we'll be on hand during our working hours. So with that, I'll pass you back over to Hannah and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for passing it back over to me just as I'm hijacking the very end of the <laughs> demo. Um, it's, it. really, it's really cool to see what you've done with the dashboard as well. Um, I feel like everyone has their own little style, their own different way of getting it across. And that's the, the beauty of the flexibility of it, I think, is that you can really add kind of a personal flair to it or you can really use it to implement best practices across your whole organization if you want every dashboard to be set up for your reports in a very specific way it's an option as well um but i do certainly like seeing how everyone uh, tries it in their own different way um and as you were just mentioning sai of the the free trial You've seen Tola Data. We've talked about how different tools can integrate with Tola Data and the importance of digital M and E. And I hope that um, I hope that some of it has been beneficial, new, interesting, hopefully even exciting. I personally, I don't know, is it a, a bit of a nerdy thing to say, but I find it all very exciting to see all of these different innovations and even from within Total Data to see the different ideas that everyone has for developments all the time. Because it's the beauty of the tool as well is that it's constantly improving. It's constantly changing and being updated based on uh, feedback from clients, feedback from free trial users, everyone who tries out the platform um, and, and different different things that we hear from them. It's how, how we keep it moving forward all of the time. Um, so on the topic of the free trial, you'll see on this uh, screen that you can try Total Data for free for 30 days. There's no commitment no financial anything you can just sign up on the website on toladata.com um, you'll see in this banner across the screen our commitment to the sector is that we offer a blanket 50 percent off our prices for ngos which means that our ngo prices start from just 49 euro for two users and um we also have you know a kind of a, a a scale for no matter how many users you might need maybe you're in a very small project or program and you only need two people who have access to total data or maybe you are in a multi-layered with many teams and many different programs type of project and it's it's entirely flexible and we can figure out something for everyone but i think either way the first step is to begin with the free trial um the second thing i want to mention before we get to the questions at the very end is the community support program um, and this is quite a new initiative from Tola Data and essentially the reason it came about is that we felt uh, a need to show even more our commitment to a more inclusive digital transformation because the team at Tola Data completely believes that developing capabilities to use technology meaningfully is essential for achieving SDGs but also even if you're not reporting to, to SDGs everyone working on these like humanitarian or development projects we're working towards a goal of improving something and we want to help reduce the digital divide, um, increase competitiveness of local grassroots and civil society organizations, um, and basically just ensure that all organizations, no matter their size or their location, have kind of equal opportunities to participate in, in the digital world and, and to benefit from tech innovation. So with the, the CSP, um, we are committed to supporting grassroots organizations with very, very affordable access to total data at just 19 euros per month. 
Um, and if you think that could be something that applies to you, you can reach out to us. Um, all of the contact details are at the top. You can email us at info at You can reach out to the live chat like I've showed already or just go straight to toladata.com forward, sl forward slash, excuse me, CSP. Um, and there you can directly apply if you just think, wow, suddenly Tola Data is affordable to me. Let me go check it out. Just, just come and apply and, and we'll review review your application as quickly as possible. Um, and it could be it could be for you. So so don't hesitate, check it out. Um, and with five minutes left to go, we want to move into some questions. So I'm aware that in some webinars you might be able to 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 interact to speak so our way around that in this uh section is to move to mentimeter so you can either use your phone if you have it and, and scan this qr code and it will take you straight there or if you want to use your your pc you can just go to menti.com and enter the code that you see on screen here and uh, what i can do with that information is see your questions pop up on screen and answer them live. Sive and I can, can answer them live. And our colleague Anya as well has been available in the YouTube comments. I saw that um, she added earlier on um, this comment about, she's a customer success executive at Tola Data. She'll be helping out with questions, but we haven't had questions um, on YouTube. So you're welcome to add them there and Anya will check them out or add them um, in Mentimeter. And that is actually what I what I started sharing accidentally when when poor Sai was just trying to finish the demo. But this is what you should be able to see. We've already looked at the instructions. Um, let's take a look at any questions that are popping up. Try and make it a little bigger. Um, and maybe it's the case that you have taken on so much information throughout this that you don't have a question right now. It's no problem. Maybe maybe we've just been so in depth or maybe you need more time to mull it over. You can reach out to info at toladata.com. You can reach out to the live chat. Same goes for if you're watching this um, recorded on YouTube and you, you must be looking at this going, oh, sugar, I wish I could have added my question on Mentimeter to have Hannah and Saib answer them live for me. Just write to us. Um, you can you can be safe in the knowledge that we will get back to your questions and we'll be excited to receive them because we've been really excited to to talk about um, this today and to, to discuss education with innovation. And hopefully... Um, Hopefully we'll have another webinar coming up soon where we'll we'll delve a little more into this side of things. I see a question has popped up. Is there a depository feature, for example, with the forms? Can it have a feature where people can put media articles, etc., as evidence? Um, yes. In the forms, if you build a an actual form in Tola Data, um, it's not possible to have someone respond with a question or with, with a, excuse me, with a, an image or a media file. But what you can do to, to add media files as evidence is when you add your data from, uh, whether it's manually from a Tola data form from any other form or source, um, what you can do is in Tola data, you can click a little button which literally says add evidence and there you'll be able to add media files or any other type of type of file that you'd like to, to add there. Um, another one, uh, does the form allow just a link to be shared to anyone like Google Forms? Yes, it does. So you, that's a really good question actually. You don't need um, a Tola Data license to fill in the form. Of course you need a Tola Data license to log into the platform, create your, create your form. Um, but once it's created, what happens is you get a link that you can share widely with your respondents and they can fill it in and then their responses will automatically populate in Tola data. And then you can add that, uh, that collected data straight to your indicators. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a good question actually, because I think 
sometimes there's the concern that you might need a license for everyone who needs to respond to a total data form, but definitely not. That's not the case. Um, and if there's any other questions, you're more than welcome to add them. We have one more screen here on Mentimeter where um, you can leave your email and we'll be in touch. I think I have the, the contact details of some people who uh, have responded to our emails already where we invited you. But if you'd like to make sure that we get in touch, you can leave your email here. It's worth mentioning that on this slide, if you add your email, it's not going to be shared. You won't see it on the on the live stream or anything like that. You can just add it and uh, we will see it on our side, but we won't share it with anyone. We can get in touch with you. Um, but it looks like we're not getting any more questions. Um, and we've hit now just 11 o'clock. Um, I wonder, Sai, if you have anything you want to add anything I haven't said or any closing words? Um, I would say that we would love for you to, to get in touch with us any which way. This can be either via YouTube, via LinkedIn. We love talking m and &E, So if you if you want to just speak with us just generally, we'd love to, to have a discussion. Um, but I think that's about it. Um, I had a really great time showing you about, and I really hope that this presentation uh, allowed you to learn something new and to maybe uh, allow you to see a new platform really interesting one that we have here so that's that's all i have for today but um hopefully i'll see you all soon again sometime awesome thank you so much for joining us thank you for watching this back if that's what you're doing and yeah we, we really look forward to hearing from you bye, bye.